Travel bloggers, independent, fearless, maverick online reviewers who tell it like it is. Or do they? On this week's programme, should travel bloggers pay their own way? We meet the online reviewers who are happy to accept a free trip. But what's demanded in return? Everything that I do on my blog is disclosed to my readers, whether it's sponsored or straight pay or anything else. We meet some of the world's top authors trying to turn Dubai's reputation for being a cultural desert on its head. And quirky courtship rituals begin on the Galapagos. Find out more on Insider Guide. I'm Fiona Foster, welcome to Fast Track. Wherever you're heading next, we hope to bring you some ideas, some inspiration, and maybe a few tips to help you along your way. Now, travel blogs are all over the internet these days, and if you've ever read any of them, well, you'll realize they vary in quality. But it does seem that some people are making a living out of them and getting to see a fair old chunk of the world at the same time. But now, as Keith Wallace reports, there are concerns about how some of them are being funded. Winter in Finland, bleak but beautiful. A travel experience for which people pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. And this man gets it for free. Michael Hodson gave up his career as a litigation lawyer to travel the world and write about it. Nowadays, he does things like this, this, and meets people like this. His attractive lifestyle is one that appears to have been converting increasing numbers of people. Finland over with, I met Michael in his next destination, Berlin. There's different types of blogs. Mine are, mine's not a research blog. It's not a necessarily go stay in these hostels or these hotels. The people that read mine are following my personal narrative, and so they are invested in my story. I do some funny things, some crazy things, some adventurous things. I fail at a bunch of things, which they kind of like. Um, so, you know, in Finland, for instance, I did uh, ice swimming. The video is horrible of me jumping in an ice lake and embarrassing, but my fans loved it because it's something they might never do. But while it may be fun for Michael, not everyone is enamoured with his way of seeing the world. Michael was given free flights, accommodation and tours from Visit Finland. The tourist board effectively paid Michael for the publicity he was giving them. It's a grey area somewhere between journalism and advertising. Now the problem with that grey area is this. If a travel writer accepts freebies from wherever they're reviewing, be it a hotel, airline or a destination, doesn't that create immediate bias in their writing? This New York web entrepreneur has created some very noisy enemies in the blogging world by highlighting his concerns with complimentary offers, and he doesn't mince his words. If you construct your whole life around getting free trips, which a lot of bloggers have, well, that's a, that's a lifestyle, but don't, don't pretend that you are doing a great service for the consumers, then you're just sort of PR marketers. The reality is you don't have a large audience. Uh, marketers are using you for uh, either misleading their clients or getting clips that really don't matter in a, in a sort of longer term sense. And having a blogger on your side can create some powerful publicity. A survey for the World Travel and Tourism Council concluded that nearly half of us have changed a trip after what we've read on sites like Facebook and Twitter. In 2010, the PR industry showed the first signs of really understanding that influence when Jordan held one of the first dedicated bloggers-only trips, letting the writers tour sites like the Dead Sea, Jarash and Petra all for free but the tourist board says it didn't directly try to control what was written. It's important that they have an independent voice because it's that independent voice that is trusted by their, by their audience and by the consumers that we're trying to reach. So we don't try and control them at all. We just give them the opportunity to experience the country and the, and, uh, the attractions that we have in Jordan as, as um, any international traveler would do. <laughs>
This is speed dating for bloggers. It's basically just networking, but in a much more intense way. On one side of the desk sit PRs for all manner of travel companies. On the other side, travel writers, waiting to find out exactly what freebies they might be offered. We're going to Australia at the end of the year, and so right now we're looking at different Australian um, hostels and hotels and tourism groups that would be interested in working with us and promoting their brand. And so, like, by, I mean, it's always a mutual, or like, a mutually beneficial relationship because um, not only do the, does it help us sustain our travel lifestyle, but we're able to promote different companies on their behalf for social media. Are travel blogs that accept incentives to travel somewhere corrupt? No. Are our technology writers who work for major magazines and newspapers who accept freebies from the companies that give it to them and then write honest reviews of that technology corrupt? No, people respect their opinions because they test the technology. They talk about why it works or it doesn't work. A blogger is based very much on its readers. Uh, a blogger is not existing without its readers. So the readers, if they see that the blogger is corrupt um, or writing unhonest things, they will penalize it, they will leave and they won't read, so the blogger will fail. Bloggers maintain that while accepting incentives, they're still able to write an impartial review of their trip. And in some parts of the world, governing bodies try to keep things transparent. Federal guidelines in the US mean all bloggers are required to state clearly what they have and haven't paid for. Guidelines that Michael Hodson follows to the letter. Disclosure is really the key. So for everything that, that I do on my blog is disclosed to my readers, whether it's sponsored or straight pay or anything else. And it's important not only for the ethics, but just so that I develop that trust with my readers. They want to know, you know these activities I can do, you know, how much am I going to be paying, or is your review uh, somehow biased? But I read the work you did uh, when you went to Finland, and they provided hospitality for you. And what you said about them was overwhelmingly positive. It was a fabulous trip. Totally unexpected for me because I'm not particularly a winter person, so I was surprised by how much fun I had. One of the things I wanted to do on that trip, though, which is going to end up being negative when I eventually write about it, was I just missed the Northern Lights. Obviously, no fault of Finland. The weather was, was horrible for it. But I managed to have a fabulous time doing a variety of other things they set up for me. Some of it completely unexpected and yeah the reviews will be glowing just because I had a great time. Michael travelled to Finland as part of a group of bloggers all of whom tried different activities. There's no doubt their writing is heavily positive though it's very difficult to say how influenced that is by the fact their trip was free. But anyway it is possible to find some balance if you look carefully. Not good enough for some though. If you are taking freebies on things that are of an extremely high dollar pound value which travel is whether it's a hotel especially whether it's a destination, because then the destination is, all, is also paying for your flight, um, then these dollar values become really high. And then it's just human nature that you will be affected um, to write about it positively. Number two. There's a financial imperative at work here. Most of the bloggers I spoke to said they couldn't carry on without help from their subjects. Anyway, they point out glossy magazines and newspaper supplements have been doing this for years. So why can't we? Keith Wallace meeting the travel bloggers who don't always pay their own way. Do let us know your thoughts on that one. Do you think the world's falling out of love with bloggers? Or would you still trust what they have to say above, say, travel magazines or even us? Send us your thoughts at the usual address, Fast track at bbc.com and we'll read out as many as we can. Time now though for a look at this week's news. If you're heading to Argentina on holiday, then be warned as the rainy season has claimed at least 35 lives in the Argentinian capital, Buenos Aires and its suburbs after a number of flash floods. Poor drainage has meant that hundreds of thousands of residents are without power. Officials say six inches of rain fell in just two hours. That's equal to all of the normal rainfall for April. Berlin's transport hubs came to a standstill this week as flights to and from Tegel Airport were diverted as a precaution after construction workers found an unexploded World War II bomb near the country's main train station. Evacuation measures caused delays on transport routes in and around the city centre. 
And it seems like a bit of deja vu for Carnival cruise ship Triumph, which was left adrift in the Gulf of Mexico last February with 4,000 passengers on board. It's now being repaired in Alabama, but strong winds caused it to break free from its moorings, drifting into a cargo vessel. And finally, there's a new reason to drop extra weight before your next trip. An airline on the Samoan Islands in the South Pacific are selling tickets not by the seat, but by the kilogram. So the heavier you are, the more you pay when flying international. And some locals think that's unfair. Skinny people will be paying less and the bigger people will be paying a whole lot more. And I've got a bit of a bit of a weight. I'm trying to lose weight, so if I go right now, it'll be quite expensive. Samoan Air says that its planes are run by weight and not seat, and travellers should be educated on this important issue. And according to statistics, Samoa has one of the highest rates of obesity in the world. Well, we're off for a short break now, but do stay with us, because coming up, Michelle's here with her monthly insider guide. And if you think Dubai is a cultural desert, well, we've got some top authors who might disagree with you. Literature has always transcended uh, adversity, difficulties, misperception, ugliness in terms of cultural contacts. Literature is actually the greatest friend maker. See you after the break. Hello, I'm Michelle Yana-Chan and this is Fast Tracks Insider Guide with my top travel tips from around the world. First to the Galapagos Islands off Ecuador. This time of year is an excellent time to visit at the end of the green season and the start of the cold water season. Flowers will be in blossom, the eggs of giant tortoises, turtles and iguanas will be hatching and there'll be newborn sea lion pups on shore. New park rules in the Galapagos are restricting how boats tour the islands in an attempt to control visitor traffic. So now a longer cruise is necessary to visit all the key sites. My top tip, if you're short of time, at this time of year choose the western route where there are plenty of penguins, dolphins and whales with good visibility for snorkelers. One of the oldest art fairs, Art Cologne, runs from April 19th through 22nd, with hundreds of international galleries showcasing contemporary, post-war and modern art. At the same time, there'll be three stellar exhibitions at downtown galleries in this northern German city. Check out the Andrea Fraser retrospective at the Museum Ludwig, as well as the work of British video artist Phil Collins, looking at the instrumentalisation of the entertainment industry. A solo exhibition of local Stefan Muller opens at the Kölnischer Kunstverein. Hong Kong is celebrating several traditional Chinese festivals, including Chong Chao Bun Festival, beginning May 14th, to honour the god Pak Tai. Enormous bamboo towers are constructed around the temple at Chong Chao and decorated with sweet buns. At midnight, there's a competition to scramble up the towers and reach the highest buns. It's also the birthdays of Tam Kung and the Lord Buddha on May 17th, the latter's best seen at Poland Monastery on Lantau Island, home to one of the world's largest bronze Buddhas. 
focusing on London fashion, the Vogue Festival takes place the last weekend of April on the South Bank, with a lineup including the industry's leading creatives like Tamara Mellon, Christopher Kane, Victoria Beckham, and Vivian Westwood. It's a real insight into the fashion industry and a behind the scenes look at it as well. Also, there's a mentoring area where you can go and talk to people individually and get insider tips on working in the fashion industry. Guests will be able to pose for their own Vogue cover shoot with the help of professional stylists and makeup artists. The same weekend, Leuven in Belgium will host the Zithos Festival, the largest beer tasting event in the region. There will be small microbreweries represented, as well as large international brands in this historic student city. Over 400 beers will be available for tasting. Across Southeast Asia, New Year will be celebrated mid-April in what's become known as the Water Festival. In Thailand, where it's called Song Kran, people carry containers of water or water pistols drenching each other in the streets. Neighbouring countries Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar or Burma all celebrate the date too in rituals said to wash away the bad luck of the previous year. And safari lovers should head to Botswana, where it's the start of the dry season. Skies are clear and the landscape still green, but rain is dissipating. Game will have left the Okavango and be moving towards the Kalahari, searching for fresh grazing. So it's a good time to combine the delta with the desert. Thanks for checking in with my Insider Guide this month. Until next time, happy travelling. Thanks, Michelle. Now to end today's programme, we're off to Dubai, home of bling, record-breaking buildings and supersized shopping malls. Now some of its crueler critics have called it a cultural desert, but now the Emirate is turning that reputation on its head by organising some highbrow culture in the desert, as Amandeep Bangu now reports. <laughs> Dubai, boasting the tallest building in the world, beautiful beaches and the best of big city living with a population of just over 2 million people. But who would have thought the Dubai desert would be the setting of a literature festival? The festival itself is in its fifth year, but this is the first time they're bringing it out in the open for a poetry session under the stars. This is just one of 200 events held across a week, ranging from performances to debates and workshops with some of the world's best known authors and poets, including the Booker Prize winner Ben Okri. I think the Middle East is very saturated with politics, our perception of it and our misperception of it. I think it's very important to bring so many critical, cultural, artistic voices together. Literature has always been one of the great unifiers. Where people fight wars with one another, they read one another's books. Um, literature has always transcended uh, adversity, difficulties, misperception, ugliness in terms of cultural contacts. Literature is actually the greatest friend maker. Um, and so this, for that reason, I think this festival is going to be very important, not just in terms of the region, the Middle East, um, but, but for the world. Nigerian-born Ben grew up in London before returning to his homeland with his family in the 60s. Much of his early fiction explores the political violence that he witnessed firsthand during the Civil War. For him, events like this create the rare opportunity to meet his readers. The writers are chosen based on their popularity as well as critical acclaim. Although organisers ensure the festival abides by the laws and regulations of the UAE, they are keen to balance cultural sensitivity with artistic expression. When you go to any of the sessions, you will see Emiratis there in force, you will see every other nationality as well. I think it's dialogue, conversation, um, disagreeing, all of those happen at a literary festival. I think it is very good for Dubai and I think Dubai is absolutely the right place for those kind of things to happen.
And with a dream lineup of award-winning authors, the appeal for the audience is the rare chance to meet the writers behind the words they've savoured so much. Listening to poetry, especially the local Arabic poetry, in the desert, under the stars, was an exceptional, exceptional, magical moment for me. And I think there's this misconception about Dubai uh, about being a fairly superficial, cultureless place, and it really isn't. It is a melting pot. It's a really soulful way to experience poetry. And for the writers, festivals like this mean a meeting of minds. It is very important for us as an author to meet uh, different authors coming from around the world. Uh, I found it uh, quite uh, exciting, quite interesting that the festival organized this night in, in the desert and it will give all of the uh, participants and the audience a flavor of this country of the heritage of this country. In this wonderfully atmospheric and intimate space, entertained by poetry and music, it's hard to believe we're actually in the middle of the desert. The flames and the birds were all that I could hear. And as the night came on, with pollen settling on the glass ceiling. A 300 strong audience are entertained with poetry in languages from Arabic. Too Icelandic. Fortunately, with English translations throughout. Although this festival is new on the global art scene, it's already one of the biggest in the Middle East, attracting a total of 30,000 visitors over the week of events in Dubai, which still remains one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Next year's event takes place in March and promises to be even bigger. Amandeep Bangu in Dubai. Well, that's it for this week, I'm afraid. But next week, six months on from Superstorm Sandy, will America's East Coast be ready for this year's tourism season? I'm in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, one of the hardest hit areas during Hurricane Sandy. This town relies on tourism in the summer months to make money and to stay afloat. Much of the debris has been cleared, but there's still a lot to be done. Business owners we spoke with are using their own money to fix their businesses before the summer, and some don't know if they'll even open again. All my equipment is gone, 400000 450000 and for me to replace it now, we're talking maybe six, seven, eight hundred. I think at the point of my life from my age that it's just, I don't know if I'm going to come back. But the mayor promises that the boardwalk, which was completely destroyed, will be finished by the end of May, which is when the season opens on Memorial Day weekend. And so this will be cleared out and safe for swimmers, hopefully by Memorial Day. No, not hopefully, 100% guaranteed. Both people are holding up their ends. We're working on our end of the businesses are, and the town's working on their end of the boardwalk. I think it'll be perfect. Join me next week on Fast Track to find out if business owners will meet their deadlines. Do join us for that if you can. In the meantime, stay up to date with our travels online by following the links shown on your screen now. But until next time, from me, Fiona Foster, and the rest of the Fast Track team, wherever your travels take you next, have a fantastic time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.